remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. America's evil genius, Travis Cook, back with you once again. Separation of church and state. It's a phrase that you likely have heard countless times throughout your life. If you're an American or if you have grown up in this nation, you likely have heard the phrase separation of church and state so often that it comes across to you like a, a very obvious phrase, uh, something that goes in one ear and out the other. You probably regard it the same way that you would regard someone saying the sky is blue or water is wet. Something that just seems so obvious and something that's been so repeated to you through your life that eh, you don't really even question it too much. You hear separation of church and state, you probably don't react to it very much. But have you ever stopped to think, have you ever stopped to consider, whether or not separation of church and state has been a positive thing for America? Is separation of church and state a good thing for our nation? Is it a concept that is worthwhile for us to govern by? It's worth considering. A lot of people never really thought of it. I wanted to examine that question today. First of all, before we go deep into the question of whether separation of church and state is a positive or a negative thing, it must be acknowledged that there is some degree of debate over whether separation of church and state actually exists or not. Now, most people, of course, when they talk about it, will uh, steer you to the First Amendment, the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, and they like to use that as a proof, if you will, of the separation of church and state. But let's look at the text of the First Amendment and see what it says. The text says, and I quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right to people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for redress of grievances. Okay, well, the words separation of church and state do not appear in that passage. They're not there. Really, all it says concerning religion is that the federal government cannot establish religion. Okay, so we can't have a first church of the federal government of the United States. Okay, that we pretty well agree on. But there's nothing in there that indicates that, that any law passed in the federal government must be completely devoid of any religious influence whatsoever. There's nothing in there that indicates that any politician must check their religion at the door when they do their job. There's nothing in that phrase that indicates that a business must uh, make their decisions without any sort of religious influence. Nothing there at all. And furthermore, if you look at the... Uh, original states that joined the Union, the 13 colonies that became states at the time of our founding. A lot of them would have had state constitutions that would have been problematic if the modern understanding of separation of church and state had been legitimate, if that was the case at the time. For example, five states in the, in the Union at the time of our founding, five states required public office holders to be Christians. Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland, Delaware, North Carolina, in addition, seven states among the original 13 required that public office holders state that they believe in God. Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. So one would think that if separation of church and state were something legitimate, if that were actually a doctrine in the Constitution, then those state constitutions would have been rather problematic at the time of our founding. They would have had to have been altered or changed or whatever in order to pass muster. And yet this did not happen. Those requirements I just told you about, as far as I know, none of them were ever overturned in a court case. None of them were ever challenged by the federal constitution. Those states did eventually let those laws uh, and those requirements go by the wayside. They changed them themselves. Although I wonder if that was such a good idea. It seems laws like that and constitutions like that at the state level might be a rather good thing today. Could you imagine if the state of Missouri only allowed Christians to hold public office or only allowed Christians to vote? That would be great, and it would be totally legal, but I'm going off on a tangent here. Bottom line is, that wasn't problematic at all. It was accepted. It could even be argued that the way the Constitution, the federal Constitution was written, 
was meant to allow those states to make such judgments. For a little backup on this, I want to go to noted author, historian, and history professor Larry Schweikart. He's a history professor over at the University of Dayton, and he has written a book called What Would the Founders Say? that really addresses this topic head on, and I want to quote from Schweikart just a little bit here if you will indulge me. Schweikart says, Clearly, 10 states out of the 12 with constitutions prior to 1787 would fail any modern test concerning separation of church and state, with only New York and Virginia passing. All 10 of these states did what they wished with respect to laws concerning the establishment of state religions and required oaths of office that would be prohibited for federal offices under Article 6 of the Constitution. None of these states that favored certain religions felt the need to amend their constitutions to conform to the United States Constitution, and thanks to the Tenth Amendment's protection of state sovereignty and the fact that the Constitution's prohibition of a state religion only applied at the federal level, they were not compelled to do so. Through these state constitutions, the founders sent a statement that should have resonated into modern times. While the United States Constitution restricted the federal government from certain activities, those same actions were permissible in the individual states. Just as important, and clearly inferred from the Tenth Amendment, communities could take actions or enforce restrictions that neither the federal government nor the states could take or enforce. Schreikart goes on to say, Certainly, restrictive laws evolved at the local level. Property covenants, zoning restrictions, blue laws, prohibition on the selling of alcohol, education requirements, marriage laws, curfews, and licensing. Religion, thus, was viewed essentially as a local issue and certainly did not rise to a national level, hence the prohibition of a national religion. So there you go. No separation of church and state in the Constitution, just you can't establish a national religion. If the individual states or localities want to have religious requirements or things like that, they can do it. It's no big deal. Now, those of you who are really big in the separation of church or state deal, you're, you're going on about Jefferson. You're yelling right now, what about, what about Thomas Jefferson's letter to the Danbury Baptist Association? Well, it was just that. It was a letter. It was essentially the 18th century equivalent of some talking head going on CNN or Fox News and giving some talking points. Sure, it's interesting. Sure, it's worthy of discussion. Sure, it's compelling. But it has no legal standing. I mean, hey, those of us who oppose Obamacare, if we would have gotten an email from our congressman that said that, hey, Obamacare, uh, you know, Obamacare should not be the law of the land, would that give us any legal standing? No. What Thomas Jefferson wrote to the Danbury Baptist Association was the same thing. So there is considerable debate on whether the separation of church and state actually exists. There is significant debate on whether the separation of church and state is actually real. But, going beyond that, even if the separation of church and state were real, would it be preferable? Would it be a good thing? Would it be a positive thing? After all, despite the debate, despite the argument that's out there over it, you don't see a whole lot of people out there that are up in arms about it. Most people today have kind of accepted the concept, false though it might be. So, is it a good thing? Well, let's examine that. It seems to me that since most of our moral compasses either come directly from the religion that we worship, or are shared by the dominant religion in a society, it seems to me that separation of church and state, as it's commonly understood, would require us to make decisions in a moral vacuum. Well, is it really such a good thing to make decisions in a moral vacuum? Do you really want to go around your life making important decisions without any consideration of what's right or wrong? And there's some people saying that, oh, you, you don't have to be religious to be moral and there are people out there who are atheists or that kind of thing claim they have a moral code well you very well might but that moral code most likely to the extent that it's positive at all 
you've probably learned that moral code because you have benefited from living in a society where Christianity has been such a dominant religion. In other words, you've grown up in a society where you know murder is wrong and theft is wrong and rape is wrong. And even though you don't believe in Christianity, you've benefited from living in a society where the majority of people who live here know that murder is wrong, rape is wrong, theft is wrong because of our religion. The, that religion has shaped the laws we have and the way we teach people. It's kind of slipping a little bit the last 50 years, but the fact that you've grown up within a moral religious society, even if you are not religious yourself, has benefited your moral compass. That's why you don't run around murdering, you don't run around stealing, you don't run around raping. Because our religion has shaped the society that has given you the moral code to know not to do so, even if you don't understand where that's come from, even if you don't understand how you have benefited from the Christian religion. But that seems to be slipping, especially uh, the last half century or so. And look at the repercussions that America has suffered since we have become more secular, since uh, roughly the 1960s. You could make an argument for some time periods before that, but that's really, really when it kicked into overdrive. What has happened since then? Illegitimacy has gone through the roof. Broken homes, broken families all over the place. Divorce rate over 50%. The idea of a firm family uh, being the bedrock of our society is almost laughable now. Seems like more kids than, than not grow up in a single parent household or in a very unstable situation. You've got crime all over the place. You go through your inner cities, they're war zones. Look at, for example, all the mass shootings. That did not always happen. And yet people will tell you, they'll try to blame it on the guns, but the guns have been around since day one in the society. We've never been without guns. So the guns didn't change, something else did. It's our secularism that changed. It's the fact that we've tried to teach our kids and our society that ah, right and wrong is uh, up for debate. And there really is no firm right and wrong. And hey, we've got people going into public places and shooting everybody up as a result. There's a moral depravity out there. I don't know that you'd find five people that would say, hey, America, not even in terms of politics, but just America as a whole is a more moral nation in 2014 than we were in 1954. It'd be very hard to find people that would say that. So there's the repercussions. This moral vacuum that we've been coming up in has frankly brought our society to its knees. So do the proponents of separation of church and state really want us to live in a moral vacuum? Do they really want us to make all of our important decisions in a moral vacuum? Well, that's the dirty little secret, it seems to me. I'm not sure that the proponents of separation of church and state, especially your liberals, I don't know that they genuinely want a moral vacuum. It would seem like a moral vacuum to us, but it doesn't seem like one to them. Instead, what they actually want is their moral compass to carry the day. What they consider a moral compass, immoral as it might actually be, is based in secularism, but it's worshipped by them just as fervently as any religion would be worshipped by us. They wish to establish the moral compass of secularization as the only acceptable moral compass, or perhaps religion, as the basis for all government and business. Now, you may think I'm sounding a little weird by calling secularization a religion. Well, you can make the argument for it. I mean, granted, they don't have deities like we know them, but one could say they worship at the altar of academia and science and journalism and big government the way that we Christians worship at the altar of God. Lots to be said for that. The, the mechanisms and initiations are not very different at all. And look at the objections of the Hobby Lobby case that liberals raised. So angry that a business is now allowed to use their moral compass based on a religion to make decisions about how they spend their health care money, but at the same time trying to put forth their moral compass that women are entitled for somebody else to pay for their birth control or health care or whatever. They don't want Christianity to just go away in, in the government 
and not be replaced by anything. They want to replace it with what they consider to be, to be a moral compass of their own and really what they regard and what they act out as a religion. Makes you wonder if that might be a violation of the First Amendment. I don't know. Would be an interesting topic to discuss, I suppose. But the bottom line is, separation of church and state does not exist if you actually look at the Constitution. Moreover, we've seen in the last 50 to 60 years what happens when you remove religion and morality from the public square. And it's not pretty. And finally, we understand that even though it seems to us moral people, those of us who do not see a separation between morality and religion, because really there is none, we've seen that the left does not wish to simply have all of our decisions made in, in an entirely vacuous moral, uh, moral situation. No, they want their morality, their religion, their beliefs forced upon the rest of us. They don't want a separation of church and state. They want a codification of their church and state. Well, game on. It's a battle of religions to influence this country not a situation where we're trying to keep religion from ruling this country. The question is, is it going to be the right religion, our religion, or is it going to be the wrong religion of secularism and liberalism? That's it for this week. This is America's Evil Genius. We'll see you next time.